it's time to dive into one of Australia's creepiest cold cases. This was actually a request on my TikTok channel, but it is such a weird case that I did not want to have to abide by time restraints. So I am going to make this specifically for you guys on the YouTube world. All the way back in January 1966, three children departed on foot to visit the popular Glenelg Beach. Of course, January is a hot summer month in Australia. It's summertime. Armed with enough money to ride the bus and get some snacks, Jane 9, Arna 7, and Graham 4 headed off for a harmless day of fun in the sun. Of course, Jane was known as being mature and responsible. This was not the first time that the three kiddos ventured out on their own. By the time the 2 p.m. bus came and went in their home neighborhood, Nancy, the kiddo's mother, grew sick with concern. Their father came home early from a business trip, and together they searched high and low. They visited family friends and flagged down people on the street, but the kiddos could not be located. At 5.30 p.m., both parents solicited the help of the Glenelg police. Authorities began an investigation and learned something chilling. Several witnesses had spotted the children near the beach in the presence of a tall, strange man. Several other sightings occurred at a local cake shop in the same neighborhood. Locals began fearing the worst. The possibility of this now being a homicide or sex crime attracted police attention from all over. Of course, there was no internet back then, so things did not spread like wildfire like they do now, but obviously this case made a huge impact. A bakery owner placed Jane in his shop the afternoon that they went missing, purchasing a pastry and a meat pie. This is important because the children were regulars at the shop and they had never purchased a meat pie before, nor did they enjoy such a thing. Plus, the children did not initially have enough money to cover the purchase, which just leads back to the theory that they were not alone. The parents described Jane as being incredibly shy and soft-spoken. The idea that she would lead her siblings into playing with a stranger just seemed out of character. This led to a theory that perhaps the children already knew the strange man. In fact, all three children had been to the same beach the day prior. Perhaps the children met him and had grown to trust him. Witnesses claimed that the man left the three children to change and the kiddos just patiently waited for him to return so that they could all depart the beach together. Of course, these days, we understand a lot more about these cases. Pedophiles sadly engage in a form of manipulation known as grooming with their victims. It can transpire slowly over the span of weeks, months, or years, and sometimes it can be quite quick, but it's all about becoming known as a trusted friend. And at the time, Glenelg was known as a very safe, wholesome place to live. People did not lock their doors at night. Everybody knew their neighbors well. Kids were allowed to head off for the day to play. There was no reason for parents to believe that they wouldn't be safe. There were some perplexing sightings. Of course, at 3 p.m., the children were allegedly spotted walking along Jetty Road alone. This was the route that they would have taken heading home. A postman who knew the Beaumont family well was one of the witnesses. The children were seen by him holding hands and laughing. This was the last confirmed sighting of the three kiddos. Police began a very thorough series of searches. Several tips led them to draining a nearby boat haven, but there was no sign of the three children. They also checked the sand hills as well as several nearby buildings, the airport, and railways. Several officers were also placed on the closest interstate roads to monitor activity, but sadly, this did not bring them any closer to finding them. Time and time again, when I cover these cases, I make note of the lack of resources used in finding missing people, but that is not the case here. The police were on it. They employed every resource that they had at their disposal. That's what makes this case so damn maddening. This case grew even more frustrating when several more witnesses came forward with sightings of the children around 3 p.m. on the day that they disappeared. These witnesses, however, claimed that the three children were accompanied by a man carrying an airline's bag. So, these obviously countered the postman's singular account. I don't know about you, but this makes me immediately suspicious of him. I searched high and low and I cannot find a darn physical description of the postman. Was he tall and thin? Did he have an alibi confirmed by others? I really wish I knew more. As months passed, numerous sightings came into the police station, but unlike most missing persons cases, majority centered around the day of the disappearance or the close days following. A woman came forward stating that on the evening of the disappearance, a strange man along with two girls and a boy entered a home neighboring hers that was believed to be vacant. I mean, why did she not contact police then? I guess we never really know what's going through people's minds and you always have the bystander effect. 
But later that night, she spotted the young boy walking away alone on the street in a hurry. The strange man was in a hot pursuit of him. Sadly, he caught up grabbing the boy, and by the following morning, the home was vacant once again. A psychic later came forward with fantastical claims. His story changed so frequently it would give you whiplash. Nothing that he provided helped the case. So I'm just going to go ahead and rule him a moot point. Up until now, though incredibly tragic, this story really hasn't been any different from a lot of other missing children's cases. But two years later, in 1968, things really took a turn for the bizarre. It all started when the Beaumonts began receiving letters. Some were signed as their eldest daughter, Jane. Others were allegedly written by the creep who claimed to be caring for the children. The postmark was from Denonog, Victoria, which is just under an nine-hour drive from their home in Glen Oak. Jane's letter seemed to refer fondly to the creepy man who had taken them. Of course, ugh. The taunter explained that he had stepped up as guardian to their three children for the past two years, but was willing to reunite them. He named a meeting place, and like most creepy abductors, he set the rule that they must arrive without authorities. The Beaumonts, absolutely desperate to find their babies, did the right thing. They covertly contacted police, and an undercover detective followed back behind the couple at the set spot. Sadly, the meeting time came and went, but not a single soul arrived. The three waited for hours, hoping that maybe the man got held up in traffic. Mrs. Beaumont felt so destroyed. She had allowed herself to hope in her heart and her head. She was already considering how to spend their family's first days after their reunion. She did not want to leave. She felt like leaving was giving up. Something shattered inside of her that day. She held on to a little hope but she learned to keep it tucked away in a drawer out of sight. She had an impossible amount of love for her three children. It's the kind of love that can completely break you. Coming home without them caused her an unconquerable illness. The suffering could never be cured. She had to learn to just coexist alongside of it. Shortly after the Beaumonts arrived home, another letter came, again from the strange man. This letter claimed that because they broke his rule and brought a disguised detective, he decided that the two heartbroken parents were untrustworthy. He was actually going to keep the three children forever. It was the last letter. At the time, authorities decided that these letters were possibly legitimate. They found that the letters from Jane closely resembled samples of her handwriting. They also believed that the man had perhaps watched them from afar at the meeting place. After all, he knew about the undercover detective. Personally, I believe that it could have easily been a lucky guess. Of course, years later, in 1991, new technology allowed investigators to figure out exactly who had penned the letters. It was a 41-year-old man. He was just a foolish teenager at the time that he sent the letters. It was determined that the letters were in fact a hoax. Since then, we have developed a very long list of potential suspects. Perhaps the most horrifying is Beaven Spencer von Einem. Beaven was sentenced to life in prison in the 80s. He had been found guilty of murdering a 15-year-old boy, and many other victims were suspected. Police investigating the Beaumont case felt that the victimology and location proximity was reason enough to suspect him. He also had a slight resemblance to the composite sketch of the tall, thin man spotted with the three children. What makes this particular psychopath so unsettling was what he bragged about to his cellmate. This informant, who became known as Mr. B, claimed that Beaven often boasted to him about how he snatched three children from a beach. The reason that he abducted them was to perform surgical experiments on them in his basement. He said, and I quote, I performed brilliant surgery on them. Seems a little fantastical, right? Obvious ramblings of a deranged narcissist. Well, turns out that several of the man's suspected victims had actually been discovered mutilated. There were definitive signs that they had actually been experimented on surgically. But I have a hard time connecting a man with a teenage boy victimology to three young children, both male and female. It's certainly not completely out of the realm of possibility, but my gut tells me that Beaven is certainly a sick puppy, but the wrong sick puppy. There have been many names tossed around over the years. Of course, all of the web sleuths who I adore are constantly on this case. A lot of these suspects have committed heinous murders, but again, majority of them have a vastly different victimology. Arthur Stanley Brown, probably with the most similar victimologies, allegedly kidnapped and murdered two young sisters. 
Now it's because of this and his location that he earned his spot on the suspect list. Sadly, he was never convicted due to a diagnosis of dementia. He too had a resemblance to the suspect sketch, perhaps the strongest resemblance. James Ryan O'Neill was convicted of murdering a nine-year-old boy. He was yet another narcissistic bragger. He claimed responsibility for the trio's murder to his buddies. His arrogance even gained him a spot center stage in a documentary about the case called The Fisherman. Truth is, there is not a shred of evidence to connect him, and he wasn't even in Glenelg at the time. To me, one of the most likely of all suspects was Harry Phipps. Now, his story is interesting. Harry Phipps also resembled the composite sketch, though it's certainly not uncanny. He lived right near the neighborhood of the Beaumont children's disappearance. Unlike many of the other suspects, Phipps lived an affluent existence. He owned a local factory and was known to hand out money to local youth. He was never really on authorities' radar while the investigation was active. It wasn't until several authors launched an investigation of their own for a book that he was put under a microscope. The book titled The Satin Man Uncovering the Mystery of the Missing Beaumont Children pretty much blew the case wide open. After such a long, lifeless drag of time, the cold case gained new interest. The book uncovered a pattern of behavior in Harry Phipps that was alarming. He allegedly had committed numerous acts on children. His wealth and status tragically allowed him the freedom to abuse without facing consequences. The sick son of a bitch picked his victims wisely. He knew that the parents would be petrified to cross him. I have to say, I would profile the hell out of this case right to Harry Phipps. The book was published in 2013. Unfortunately, Phipps died a way too merciful death in 2004, but it did provoke a reopening of the case. That same year that The Satin Man was published, a small section of ground at the factory, once owned by Phipps, was excavated. Ground penetrating radar found an anomaly which was indicative of objects buried in the soil, but absolutely nothing of substance was found. A further excavation of the area was performed in 2018, but only bones that tested positive for belonging to an animal were discovered. Considering the fact that investigators have circled back to the factory tells me that there's likely some strong evidence out there linking Phipps to the case. This story has many torturous layers. It's honestly like a rotting onion. The bright side is the fact that interest has continually renewed in the investigation over time. This honestly gives me hope that it will, in fact, one day be solved and closed. Sadly, Nancy Beaumont went to her grave with a big chunk still missing from her heart. She passed in a nursing home in 2019 at the age of 92. I can only hope that her heart was made whole in death and that she was reunited with her three lost babies.